Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Level Up Cleveland. And this week, we have with us in the studio, Mr. Billy Sullivan. Hello. That's right. We got Billy in here. And uh, just to go over a few of his accomplishments and some of the bands he's been in, real quick, just to remind everybody, he was in Deuce, the Paul Pope Band, Club Wow, Moonlight Drive, Boku, Spina, and Sullivan. He's actually currently still doing the Spina Sullivan thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were with Gary Lewis for a, a period also. 23 years. Yeah. Um, and you do your solo thing. Yes. You have that also. Um, and the Herman's Herbits. Yes. Herman's. It's the hardest thing for me to say sometimes fast. Yeah. Herman's Hermits, though, you're also in. And you guys are still doing that also. You and uh, Rich are still yes. doing that also. Absolutely. Where you guys get to actually just travel. I mean, I, I watch you on, on uh, social media all the time, and you guys just, well, here we are. We're headed to Seattle. We're headed to yeah. here. We're headed to there. You guys do a lot of casinos and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, we do casinos. We do some uh, actual, you know, theaters, um, summer festivals. Uh, it, it, uh, the venues vary. And you guys are almost always, like, sold out. This thing, these things do well, correct? I mean, Peter like, is a wonderful entertainer. He's, uh, you know, from the genre of the 60s, he still looks great. Uh, he puts on a great show. He's very funny. He's oh, very yeah. entertaining, and he still has his voice. Uh, when you hear him sing those songs, it's like you're listening to the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys sound great. Well, and, he, and he's assembled a hell of a backup crew yes. to, to accompany him with yeah. this whole thing also. And uh, Northeast Ohio is uh, heavily represented in that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and go figure, it's a British band. <laughs> yeah, right. It happens all the time. But I want to go back. I want to go back to uh, the beginning, really. I mean, that's the, that's, you know... Um, you have a, you're, you're one of those that started very early. You were like a professional, like around 13 years old or something like that. You already started getting paid for, for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's, you know, Brook Park growing up in Brook Park, there was a, a lot of garage bands and a lot of really, it was competitive, but it was all in a, in a good way. And, uh, and it was a lot of talent, a lot of great talent in that city back then, you know, in the seventies, ever you know, we practiced in the garages and stuff and we'd end up getting gigs at like the battle of the bands and then we get actual paying gigs at like a cyo dances and church dances oh yeah <laughs> and for us the band deuce that i was in we were we won a battle of the bands uh i forgot where we it was in north Olmsted where we actually I, we actually lost the one in brook park because i uh i got a brand new marshall half stack and I didn't really know how to use it yet, so I had it on 10. And it ran everybody out of the, the Brook Park Armory, so we lost. Oh. My dad said, you messed it up. You know, so I, the next day, we played the one in North Olmsted, so we turned it down a bit and actually actually had it mixed well, and we actually won that one. And how old are you at this point? I was 14. Wow. And we actually, one of the, one of the, one of the prizes, I forgot if we won any kind of money, I don't re remember, but... What I do remember is we got to play the corral in the the, uh, the famous rock club in the west side of Cleveland back then, and it was they used to have their Teen Tuesdays, and we got to play or warm. I think we warmed up for a band called Teaser, and stuff. And that's why I, I actually that's where I met Rich for the first time. Was Love Affair used to play there all the time. Oh, oh, oh. and uh, and that's how it started. You know, we started getting small gigs into like some bar gigs supporting 
the big, bigger local acts, and uh, to the point where they liked us, to, uh, to the point where we were able to have a night on our own in different places and stuff. So it was, you know, I had to have her parents there, obviously, because yeah, right. it was a bar. It was a little, and things were things were a little better back then, though, about stuff like that. Yeah, uh, they, people people kind of turned, you know, uh, right. <laughs> you know, it's a little different than it was is today. That's true. So back then in Brook Park, there was a lot of also like it, one of the cool things about it was there were a lot of venues for the music that was. Act- Let me ask you real quick: What do you think? Do you think that the fact that the, the venues were there kind of created the the musicians, people wanting to play music and wanting to be like that, or it was the fact that you guys had all this talent in Brook Park kind of made the venues what they became? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, for me personally. Seeing, I, I used to go to these dances and I see bands like, uh, well, Love Affair, and I would see uh, uh, there was a, uh, there was a band called Strutter, that was a great, great Cleveland so band. So Deuce and Strutter were talking. So yeah. Far. <laughs> so, did you guys do any Kiss There's songs? A theme. <laughs> and we did, but yeah. I, I just remember seeing those other bands, and for me, that was the ambition. I wanted to be where they were at. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the thought of being a rock star and playing the Coliseum, that was just such a stretch. For me, I just I wanted to be in a, in a local, popular band that was hitting all those clubs because there were so many venues to play. And it was fun looking, right? You were Absolutely. watching this and you're like, these guys are having the a girls blast. are there in front yeah. of the band and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I want to do that. Well, and you're watching a time in every one of these bands, uh, part of their career, where they're just playing it for the love of it and, and the and – the, and the will to try to get to a point, right. there's still really, that whole passion is still there. That's the most fun time to watch a right. lot of these musicians Absolutely. when that's still going on. Well, that was, you know, that was the that was the thing. I remember my parents saying, don't, you know, think about the money too. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't just do it for fun. Think, yeah. You're going to get paid for this, you know. Well, they stuff. saw something in you possibly even early yeah. on that was uh, yeah. that you could because a lot of parents are like, got a job. You know, like don't don't waste your time with this. And and you you do have. I mean, obviously, there's some things about you that stand out. That uh, even uh, when we had Rich on, he was saying, you know, you your your pitch is perfect. And he says his is relative per, per, uh, yeah, relative. I think, pitch. I, I think it's gotten worse over the years. But I don't I, know. I haven't. I, I've been watching your stuff. I can't find <laughs> anything wrong with it. Um, but that's something that obviously. You know, you were in, obviously you were into music at an early age, and so obviously music leads to people singing. So people hear your voice at an early age right. and realize, wow. <laughs> well, I remember early on when I started, nobody thought about being the singer. At least I didn't. Yeah. You know, I, I was in a band where, okay, who's going to sing? Not me. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, and I remember my brother Dan telling me, he says, no, you have to sing because it's going to up your game. You know, my brother Dan used to hang out with Rich, and he was – Went to school with Rich and all that whole clique of of people, and he so he was around it, so he saw it, and he and he all he all he pretty much told me at, at a very early age. He says, "No, you start singing, add harmony. It just ups your game as a musician." Big he time. was absolutely right about well, that. Well, plus it and it ups your uh, the possibilities of people who you can play with and do things with. They, right. you know, when you start getting into those the upper echelon of this whole entire thing. A, a guitar player has to be able to do harmony. Absolutely, has to be able to sing and stuff, or you're not even going to be considered. You know, to have to have a job like what me and Rich have now, you got to bring more to the table oh, yeah. than just playing your instrument. You know, you got to, you know, the more hats you can wear, as far as being a side musician, the more things you can do and bring to the table, the better off you'd be. Well, plus you, I, I think you've taken that to another level because you're also an accomplished drummer, percussionist. Uh, you say you say you tinker with the keyboards, but a little bit, yeah. But I mean, like, but you can play. I mean, I I've seen you in on video when we had the Drew Loesch thing. I think when you're was it the Tammy Shanner? Weren't you playing drums there? Yeah, I yeah, played drums on a couple. Yeah, times. I was, yeah, I was watching. I'm like.
fun. Those were fun nights at there back then. At the yeah, and I and Drew just had his, you know, he had his cameras set up, and uh, he he got all that stuff documented. Oh, he's still, I I still talk to him, and and I every once in a while I'll be like, hey, there's this thing coming up. You wanna you're thinking about coming out and bringing some cameras out, and he's like, he's always game. He's a cool guy. Yeah, yeah. I love his documentary. Yeah, I hope it sees more of the light of day. Oh, than, yeah. than what he intended. Well, we I have I have it now, so I I keep trying to little by little. I want to work it out there too. Yeah, stuff that gets out there. Especially he just sent me the whole Tammy Shander thing. I have the all of it now. Oh, that's and I'm great. like so little by little. I want to start emptying it out and getting it out there because that was a wild night. Those are fun. It's just wild how how. One that one night that he really did that, a lot of that filming was really done in that yeah. one night, and how much came out of that, and how it's still talked about, and how it's people are still remembered, it. and not just average people. These are like some of the better musicians that came out of that era. Oh yeah, if I can there. remember, you, you know, there, you had Ed Sarley, uh, George was there, George Sippel, I think uh, John Solomon was uh, was there at one of those. Of course, Jeff and Laura from the Rock Shop, Don Kruger, oh yeah, uh, Rich. Paul Sedotti uh, was on uh, there that night. The who's who at the time? Basically, yeah. a lot of them. It was right? a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So you're you're in the you're in Deuce, and what happens? What happens with Deuce? How does that? Were you guys writing your own stuff too, or we, was this a cover band? We mostly? dabbled. We did have like one original song called "What's Your Act." It was just <laughs> you know, kind of sounded like a you know, we were three piece, so we basically we sounded like either Kiss or maybe a scaled down Aerosmith. Are you singing at this point too? Or? Yeah, very poorly, but I, I did. You got better. Our bass player was the better singer at the time. But oh. uh, did you guys switch off though? You guys, we you did. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, we did. Um, uh, we ended up getting a different drummer. So that back then, if the drummer owns the sign of your band, on his side. you have to change the name of the band and get a new sign. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did. We changed our name to. Uh, Deuce to Bastille. It's another, like a Rush a yeah, reference. It is, totally. Even though we only did a couple Rush songs. Canadian reference, totally. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but uh, we ended up, uh, that band ended up doing some some gigs around town and stuff. But it, it became, I think, one of the members, we we're only three of us, one of the members was just kind of getting disinterested. Yeah. And I was, at that point, my my I was really driven to really try to take it to the next step. And then I, uh, the band disbanded. I put an ad in the paper, in the classifieds, seeking top-notch professional musicians, not really knowing, you know, what, what was the, about to happen. What to happen? <laughs> but one of the persons that a- answered that ad was Tom Chris, the original bass player from the James Gang. Oh. So he he came over to my parents' house with his big Sherwin Vega, ace amp, and he had his Fender Jazz bass. And uh, at the time, I didn't know who Tom was, but he looked like Tom Chris. He had the mustache and the and the hair and, and stuff. And, uh, you know, we ended up practicing and playing. And uh, I think he was starting to think, wait a minute, you might be younger than what I was envisioning. <laughs> yeah. He asked me, how old are you? I said, I'm 19. I was 15. Oh, my. <laughs> That's how driven I was. I wanted to get to that next step. And uh, we we rehearsed. It was uh, myself and Dave Friedman, Sammy Free's brother, on the drums, and uh, Tom. And we were thinking of getting a lead singer and a keyboard player. And then about a week later, Tom calls and says, uh, I'm going to have to leave because I have this job offer, potential offer to be a road manager for Paul Pope from Moki Cole. Oh, the connection. So at the time... I don't think he was even considered to be a bass player. He was going to kind of road manage the band. And uh, I would say, well, it's great to meet you and stuff, and I was back to square one. A, w- a week after that, I get a call back from Tom. says, says, we're, do- we're auditioning guitar players. So I get to the audition. My mom drives me. I don't have my driver's license yet, <laughs> mind you. And I was late for the audition wow. because I had to do a high school fun- music function so these guys were really ticked off when, you know, I'm huffing my Marshall cabinet down the stairs, the basement stairs. And so they're like, okay, let's hear what you got and stuff. I think we plugged in. I plugged in and did a crack, you know, quick uh, check of the guitar. And we did like Rocky Mountain Way or something. And the, they basically said, well, well, we'll let you know. I ended up getting the gig. 
I remember Paul saying to me, he says, uh, okay, this, here's the deal. I'm going to do 60% of the lead guitar. You're going to do 40%. I said, great, fine. That changed after a while. You know, nothing against Paul. Paul's a great guitar player himself, but we worked that out to where it would, it, we complimented each other. Or 50-50. If yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it, the rest is history. And I, the next twist of that story is like, I got the gig. Now I have to convince my parents that this isn't a local thing. These guys are going on the road. And you're still 15? Is it, you're, I you're... just turned 16. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so my mom, I, I told her first because she she was the one, if there was any musician in our family, it would have been her. Oh. And she never had a chance to play professionally, but she had an opportunity. That's a different story. But I knew she would be understanding about it. And but she was torn. I mean, how can you go to your mom and like say, "Hey, I might I'm gonna have to quit school, high school, to take this to job." Pursue to something, yeah. And uh, took a lot of soul searching. She a lot of she had to convince my dad. Ooh. What really did it was my high school counselor told my folks, "I said, why is he here? He's here for an occupation. He has he has a job offer." I say I say let him take let him let him do wow, it. Wow, cool counselor. Yeah, and I mean, it's not like I did bad in school. My grades were fine. Yeah. It was my sophomore year, year of high school. And um, I took, uh, they let me go. Uh, and uh, I remember my father, my father pulls me aside. He goes, any drinking and drugging, this, all this is done. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks later, he comes, my parents come up to visit me in Buffalo where we're playing. Come on, have a shot with your dear old dad. <laughs> Everything God bless changed. you, dad. <laughs> But yeah, it was. I, I, you know, it's something I could say now. It's I never regretted that decision because it worked out for me. Yeah, it's something I would not suggest to any kid now. No, get your education. Yeah. You, there's time to get in this business if you're serious about it. But get get your get your again. Education. It was a different time. It, it was it, a different yeah, time. It was a very different time. You could make money doing music. Yeah, a, a lot of money. You could you could do well. Especially if you are an accomplished musician, right. you, you could do pretty well in this city, just playing out and playing gigs and getting yeah. in bands and doing that. Different time, you know. You know, that. it was for I. I consider it's it's uh, that I was a part of the tail end of the really cool time. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, because uh, I mean, you still got the you had the big hair and the whole bit. <laughs> some some great with, hair. Yeah. My poor hair. I'm surprised I still have any. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you had some great hair in the '80s and stuff, man. Yeah, you, had, you were you were the one of the best hairs in all the city. Well, you know what it was. <laughs> I think it, at one point, everybody there was a lot of musicians here that picked up and went out to Los Angeles. Yeah, Paul Pope included, Tommy Amato, uh, Mark Bowles, which he went on to play and sing with Ingve Malmsteen. Oh. We actually went out there together and, and uh, with Paul and stuff. And uh, you went out to LA. I did. What? How, now, when was this? 1984, and I made the attempt because it, how it was, if you knew somebody that lived there, that's what you kind of like, hey, can I, can I stay with you for a while until I get something going? Yeah. Well, I knew this girl from Buffalo. She said, yeah, come out. You can you can sleep on the couch, you know, and uh, I didn't last not too long. I ended up coming back because I had a job offer with Moonlight Drive, and they were working pretty, pretty extensively at the time, so... I said I got nothing going on here. I'm I'm coming back home. Yeah. I didn't I didn't bring I didn't bring a lot of possessions out there. I just brought a, cu uh, a couple guitars and a suitcase. So that was it. You didn't have to come back with much either. Then. I figured it's either if it happens, I'll buy stuff. Right. <laughs> if, if not, if I I could just come home with the two guitars and the suitcase. So I ended up coming home with one of the guitars. I ended up selling one while I was out there. Now you mentioned Buffalo real quick. So what what is the so you 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 have the Cleveland ties, but you also have a whole a whole situation where you have a lot of ties in Buffalo also. Well, the reason for that is Paul Pope band. They were Bulky Cole was huge in western New York. And that was uh that was our that was our city. I mean, even though we were a Cleveland based band, we went up to Buffalo every week to play. They were the ones that would pay the big money to, to for us to do our own material. Oh. Here in Cleveland, at the time, original bands were playing places like the Agora or the Fantasy or down in Kent like JB's and stuff. But, you know, we were we were actually being paid pretty decent money at the time yeah. to go up to play. We'd, we'd drive up on a Wednesday 
we play from Wednesday to Sunday. Or maybe we'd hit either Jamestown, New York on, on a Sunday, or even Pittsburgh. We played Pittsburgh at the time. But, yeah, Western New York was kind of like our home base. So why why do you think that was? Why, what, what was the – was it – so obviously you – they. They get a draw there. People were coming out to see you guys. Obviously, probably buying the music. I, you know, why, that's, why do you think that? What, what do you think took hold there? That might be a question for Paul Pope yeah, to yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. But at least when by the time I got into it, the first date we played at a place called Harvey and Corky Stage One, and Harvey and Corky were the local concert promoters in Buffalo. Harvey being Har- the Harvey Weinstein. Oh, yes, no kidding. Yeah, he was a local concert promoter at the time. And they owned the club, and basically that was kind of one of the one of the few big rock clubs of the day. And um, if they had a concert come into town, they would do have the concert. They would bring the 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 artists to that club and stuff, and they'd stay open till like four in the morning up there. You know, they they have the late license. Oh, it wasn't like here. But I remember the very that was the first place that we played. I remember there was a line out the door, wrapped around the building to see Paul. That's how big he was there. So this was your first experience with that kind of thing then, obviously. I mean, this was the first time that now you're actually seeing like... A, this a, is a touring band. It, was a, uh, they, it wasn't like a local type of thing. And, uh, and we even though we didn't have a record at the time, because the band, it was, it was Paul breaking away from Moki Cole and uh, starting out on his, on his own. But he still had the management. He still, I, I believe, he still had the label interested that would in Janus Records, who that's where the Mulkey Cole album was on. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a it was a my first I would say serious. This was a serious career. Well, group. and plus, I'm saying though, you're, you're now you're now playing to some pretty big audiences also yeah. too, right? Yeah. You know, so you know, is this is this at this point? Do you remember it being like, is this? How how are you handling that as a person? Because I think you know, like that's part of this whole thing, right? Where all of a sudden now, the, the, you turn it up a little bit, and now you're experiencing things for the first time. How did you handle that? It was the most exciting time. I still I remember the date June June first, nineteen seventy nine. That's how <laughs> it's still. I think back, it was like it was such a different level. I mean, those people. But when we when we got on stage, they were. They were right there, you yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a football game on a big screen, and you're playing in the corner. This was a. a you were the. You were the. It main... was a rock star. It was like an agora style type of stage oh, with oh. production and lights, and people. They were right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was exciting. Yeah, I bet. Tell me a little bit about the Moonlight Drive uh, days. Well, I I've seen Moonlight Drive prior to that, and I remember seeing them once at. Uh, well, I saw them at Tommy's. In Rocky River, that's kind of like where their inception was, where they kind of got their start. You know, but obviously Bill and them were from Dragonwick from years years prior. I saw them at the Cooley Mons in Illyria once, and I believe that that Bill Pettijohn got arrested that night because I used to play there too. That right next to the stage was a stage door, and he had the door open. He was kind of hanging outside, having a cigarette, and having he had an open can oh. of beer. So they arrested him. Wow, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. But uh, I, you know, at, well, when I got the call, Jim Gerard uh, was their manager, and Steve Nill they managed them, and um, it was basically through them is was the interaction of how I got into the band. I didn't even meet Bill yet until like the first gig at uh, Biggie's in the Flats was my first official job with them. And Bill came to the sound. Oh, hey, I, I'm Bill Pettijohn. They call me Shecky. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he, you know, he's quite a character, but he's a lovable character. Uh, you know, um, I, 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 this is a story that uh, I, I, I keep seem to be drifting, but it kind of pertains to this. Uh, when I would be on the road with Gary Lewis, I would call home to my mom. And my mom would say, oh, guess who's here? Shecky's here. You know, my mom made the mistake. Of giving him a perk of Dan. Uh. She would, oh, here you go. Here you go. Uh, so he was there all the time. I said, like, what are you doing? It's like, this is my mom's medication, Bill. Come on. <laughs> but that's that's how it was. And there was, it was, it was, uh, that was one of those debaucherous type of bands. Uh, but at the level, when I first joined, they, they asked me, okay, what do you drink? 
This is when I was drinking. And they, they said, well, I, I'm a vodka drinker. All, all of a sudden, three bottles of, uh, of Stoli was on, the, was, on, was on the rider. <laughs> there were two cases of beer, two bottles of Jack. I mean, every night it would be You made like, sure you guys had plenty of supplies. But that started to, you know, as time went on, okay. that, that started to wane down, obviously. The spiral effect goes yeah. back on the tubes after a while. Yeah. But uh, it was, I was in the band for like maybe a year, and then I got out of it, and then I went back to them in 87. There's that little time in between where my record was out. But, uh, but yeah, Moonlight Drive was quite an experience. Yeah, that, was, that lasted, did you say, about what, a couple years total? Off? Yeah, about two years total, the, the year of 1985 and 1987. Okay, so then what, so what do you do after Moonlight Drive? Well, actually, this was during. This is how, how it's funny the chain of events would happen. During that time when I just joined the band, I got a call to do a session out at Suma recording, and it was for uh, it, the client was Tom King, and Tom King was the member. Of the, he was a member of the Outsiders. He put the band together. He wrote "Time Won't Let Me," and uh, and I was I just got hired to be the guitar player, and it turned out that the person they hired to lead sing to sing on this kind of it was a very '50s style type of song. Didn't show because it was a snowstorm that morning. I remember when I made it there, and uh, I ended up being the singer. And all of a sudden, the project got turned into me and the Billy Sullivan project. Although I didn't have, even though it was it was under my name, it I didn't have not any control at all. It was songs that they. <laughs> uh, I mean, some of those songs were great. Some of them weren't so. Uh, uh, they finally kind of let me have a hand in the songwriting and, and some of the uh, some of the things but that's how that came together right at the same time i was in moonlight drive no kid they took so your name a, so, your, your yeah. image and your likeness and just put it on their music and said this is now this but it's well, really not yeah i think tom was trying to find the next thing he was trying to find the next person oh. to manage and that's how it fall fell into my lap he saw Literally. the potential and, and yeah and i otherwise i just would have been the guitar player for the session and that would have been it but that spawned into the whole you know uh the record never again came out and stuff was through that association i see i see i see and this was all happening at the same time i was in moonlight drive so i kind of felt bad for them because at, at, at one point i i you know i signed the contract that for them to manage me and they wanted me off the road so they paid me a salary to stay off the road so i had to quit moonlight drive oh at eight that's the break eight, in between yes at eight months in and and even more ironically, at that same time, the Gary Lewis thing kind of came about uh, at the same time. All of these things were happening at the same time. So and also, it's it's I'm just guessing here now, but this is like your first time. Now you're experiencing the business part of this of this whole thing now, right? You know, for a while you're the musician, you're you're in these bands, you're learning how to play live and the touring part. Now you're dealing with the business aspects of this where people are saying, don't go with that, do this, here's some money, da 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 And you're kind of like getting caught up in this whirlwind a little bit, I would imagine. Well, at that time, it you're was... You're still young, too. It was the second time I was I entered into a management contract. The first time was with Paul, but not with his management that technically it didn't, you know, I, I was underage when I signed that contract, so it didn't really matter. Uh, it, that management fell apart in the... Uh, but yeah, that, at that time, that was the second time I've entered into a management contract and stuff. And um, scary thing. Yeah, I mean, and, and do you have an agent at this point? Are you or are you doing all this on your own, or is your parents helping you? How how are you managing yourself? I would I was managing myself pretty much. I was just kind of, it's almost like the feather in in Forrest Gump. <laughs> oh yeah. Basically, that's how my career was at that time. It was just kind of okay. Where's it going to lead to next? Yeah. And you're still, and you're, and you're in your head. It's you're still trying to like write the best song. The next is that where you're at with everything. You want to get involved in the next, th yeah, original project. I don't mean to be flipping around, but during that's how it was in those days. You'd be in something, and but you'll be involved in something else. At that time, earlier on with Paul, during the Paul Pope years. I got involved with Jimmy Zero from the Dead Boys, and that was a recording project that wasn't even the band. So that's this. These would be things I'd be doing when I come off the road. Then that became a band after a while, and that didn't last. 
Uh, I ended up going to California right after that. Kind of fell apart. That's too bad because Club Wow had great songs and it was a great band. But, yeah, uh, well, we'll get. I want to talk about them too. Yeah. Um, but but before before I get into that, there's one thing I didn't ask you yet, and, and this is kind of important because I kind of you you put a lot of material out on the internet a lot. You're always up. If people want to see you, they should have zero problem finding yeah. you and, and watching you. Um, and and I I think I get the I know the answer just been based on watching that, but. How do you get into music? Who? What are the bands that kind of like? How? What's your influences early on? How do you get involved in all this? What? The what Beatles. Happened? Okay. The Beatles. That was my. Uh, that would be my guess. When I was a kid. That was, uh, you know, I'm the. I was the youngest of six kids, so you you, you definitely listen to what your brothers and sisters, you know, uh, you know. My sister was was uh, she was the one that was into the British invasion. All the the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Searchers, Billy J. Kramer. Uh, all those groups. So she had those records. And I just, my earliest memories of life involved the Beatles. Uh, there was always a Beatle record playing somewhere. Yeah, right. So you so, so many times everything that a Beatles song comes on, it takes you back. This one takes you there. Yeah. This one. So it just it becomes, so that's your favorite band. I mean, yeah. So I just, that's, 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 that's the band. That, you know, it's funny. By the time I got into music and playing and being in a band, at that particular time in the middle 70s, it, it was almost not cool to like the Beatles. I mean, I almost had to hide that fact, you know, because at the bands of the day, let's see, 1975 would have been Kiss. Zeppelin. Zeppelin, Aerosmith. So we were a trio, so we were playing the heavier stuff. But I would occasionally like, why don't we do a Beatles song? And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, right. At this point, it, it, it well, yeah, it, and it seems like that's just the, the cycle of everything. Something gets so popular, and then all of a sudden it becomes unpopular right. to, to like that thing. So this is that time before the Beatles became legends. Yeah. And, and still, you know what I mean? Like, um, so guitar wise now because the, and that's another thing i wanted to ask you is you seem to be a very natural guitar player another thing i know a lot of, you know and it, it could t- it could have just been that you one of them guys that locked yourself in a room for the whole story about well i locked myself in a room for nine months when i came out i'm this guy um but you have a, it seems pretty natural to you was it was it something that you could pick up and you were automatically kind of already well in the very beginning we had a guitar in the house it was my mom's and she showed me i'm gonna finger the the e major the A major chord like that, and the what I call the claw B, the cool B seven chord, which is almost like a claw. That's those three chords he heard on the Elvis Presley records and the, you know, Buddy Holly records and stuff. Uh, my mom taught me those first three chords, but prior to that, it was a struggle to figure out, you know, how to tune the thing. And oh, uh, but uh, I ended up getting help from uh, I I took a few lessons from a guy named Chip Candrack. And it was interesting. He uh, he was a teacher in the west side of Cleveland, but he had he he had a he had a deformity. He had no thumb on this hand. So how he was able to put a pressure yeah, on is like yeah. But he but he but he did, and uh, he was a wonderful teacher, and he was a good guitar player too. I think he's living in Nashville now or whatever. But he kind of. He kind of explained that okay, this is how you tune it. This is what the this is. These are the bouts. This is the nut. These are the frets. The foundation. Yeah, of the, the foundation of it, and uh, everything else. I was picking up on my own to the point where he told my mom. He says, "I'm taking your money. I don't. He's 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 on his way, you know." But I I enjoyed those lessons with him because we would just trade off and and stuff. And he he showed me the the foundations of of lead guitar as far as like the vibrato, uh, the bending. Oh, all the little and, tricks uh, and techniques. He goes, if you take the pick like this and if you, you can get the, the, the squeak thing, like how, uh, you know, like uh, Billy Gibbons on LaGrange. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. That, that thing. He taught me all those <laughs> things. Little tricks and stuff. Now, once he taught me that stuff, I would go back and listen to records like, oh, I know what he's talking about now. Oh. So like Rockin' the Fillmore, Humble Pie, that was like it was a big guitar record for me. Montrose first album was a big guitar album for me. Led Zeppelin, uh, so I was listening to that stuff because it was like, oh, I could figure this out, oh, you know. And yeah, 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 yeah. and I loved it as a kid, but I was at the same time I was also listening to the Eagles and the Beatles and the, you know, just any kind of rock and roll music that we all loved. That's what I was listening to too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're basically um, drums. Also, you just you did you also decided to pick up. Was that later on? You decided to do that. Because- that would have been first for me because my oldest brother was a drummer. 
No kidding. He played in a band called the Shades of Grey. They didn't really do much. <laughs> But he enlisted in the Navy, and he went to Vietnam, so the dr- he sold the drums. So that was the end of my drumming until I got to junior high. I was in the symphonic band where I actually played drums. And uh, I kind of remembered, I picked it up then. And whatever bands I was in, the, the drummers would let me kind of get behind the Take kit. Take her around? So that's basically how you you, yes. you you got better through the years. You would yeah. just play other people's kits and right. stuff. Do you have a kit of your own now? I Used to when I when I moved to Chicago, I had drums in my studio, but I end up selling them. I I do want to get a drum kit. I just don't have room for them now. Yeah. So, I mean, ironically, <laughs> I sold the drums. I get called for a drum gig up there. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So, like immediately right after? Yeah. Did you ever consider like an electronic kit and just something so a little smaller and Could easier be. to record with too? I Could mean, be. yeah. Um, because I, you're you're doing your own stuff, and when you do your own stuff, don't you play pretty much all the instruments? I on did, it? yeah. Because at the time when I recorded that stuff, I was this before the move to Chicago. I had the studio in the basement, so I had the drums all mic'd and triggered, ready to go. So I would just you know lay down the drums, or I'd put a click track first, lay a reference guitar, and then that's how I would cut, cut the drums, and then then redo everything. You know, use the drums as the foundation. Yeah, right. Build, build the, the song. Right, right. And just build it from there. Build it from the bottom up. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, one thing I did notice I did was I did, we did, we did kind of skip over Club Wow. I, I, I noticed yeah. I did that. And that was kind of a big time. That was, that was That's important for me because yeah. I considered Club Wow Jimmy Zero to me in, from the Dead Boys. And I was at that age where punk was just coming in and I, I dug it. I liked it. Uh, I love the, the, the first Sex Pistols album, the, the Dead Boys, and they were from Cleveland. But to me, Jimmy Zero, I considered him the first rock star I've met. And he was a rock star in my mind. He yeah, was. Right. I mean, I used to see him in Cream Magazine. There was a picture of him and him and John Belushi and Susan right. Sarandon. And he's, he's, he's been hanging out with these people. He's a star to me, right? And how I got started with, 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 with him was through Kirk Yano. Kirk Yano used to have a studio here in Cleveland called After Dark Recording. And this was right, right after John Lennon uh, was shot. Was shot, and uh, he was Jimmy Zero was doing some recording, some music there. Uh, I got called to play, and I played uh, played on one song, and one song became three songs, and then be, the, it became a recording co- uh, project, and then it be, eventually be, turned into a band. And that's that was how I got involved with with Jimmy, and we and that was the. I would say, as far as a band goes, to me, that was my first really serious songwriting band. I, I almost think that I've never topped it. Because really? Because the songs were that good. But we were, it was at the time where MTV was now in place. Punk was kind of, we weren't really a punk band, although the origins of the band were punk because of Jimmy and Frank uh, being in the Dead Boys. Yeah. And, uh, but it was, I think this would have been 1982. Uh, I don't think the, the record companies could really figure out what we were. Are these guys a new wave band? Or are they a power pop band? What are they? Uh, they couldn't figure us out, so therefore they, there was no, never any interest to sign us. It was, they passed each time because they and, couldn't It's too you. bad because Jimmy, I think that if they had any interest in us, they were more interested in Jimmy maybe still remaining being a punk or whatever. I could be wrong about that, but that's just my take on it. That's how it seemed. Uh, that's how it seemed to me. But but nevertheless, the band was great. We were a four-piece band. We looked cool. Uh, the songs were fantastic. I, I still think I've never topped. Yeah. Never, those, top, those songs are still great to me. All, all short, quick punk songs, or were they, were they, they were, just poppy? It's weird. It, it, uh, it's, it's ironic that there's a, there's a record label called Zero Hour Records. In, from Australia, our our music. They uh, five years ago they put our album out with a DVD with all the live footage. I forgot about the live video footage. Wow! From the Agora and stuff, they put a nice package together. So they after all these years and the thirty years after the band split up, our record's out. It's out there. They put it's a double. It's like a a CD and a DVD package. No kidding. Can you go buy this like on Amazon and everything yep, like that? Absolutely. So they, they've yeah. actually released it just like a regular CD package. It's called Club Wow Retrospective, nineteen eighty two to nineteen eighty five. That's oh, the name of the album. Cool. It's really cool. I I forgot about I forgot about the video footage because we actually did a couple music videos. <laughs>
did uh, there was a lot of live footage, you know, from the uh, from the Agora, and it's that they nicely packaged it, and it's 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 really nice. Do you have a copy of it? I do. Uh-huh. I do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll have to get my hands on that. I gotta find. We got to find that. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool, and it's got mostly everything we've done from the Kirkiano days and uh, from those sessions. And once we became a band, we did a lot of recording out at Paul Pope Studio in Lyria before before the big move to California. Yeah. You know, it was four-track demos, and then they became eight-track demos, and we ended up eventually getting up to 16-track. But nevertheless, even the four-track stuff sounds great. Yeah. They, they, they included all of it. So all of it's there. All of it's there. Yeah, I've got to check that out. Um, so what happens with Club Wow? Well, how, does that, how does that just... It just, it fell apart. You know, we... we we basically wrote, we, our main concern was to try to get a deal so we would practice and write songs and we'd uh, try to perfect the stage uh, act. You know, Jimmy would have these things. Uh, he goes, hey, when we play the fantasy, this, we're, let's not try to be so local. Hide before you, let, be, let the first glimpse of you be on stage instead of being at the bar and, you know, those type of things. And, uh, he, you know, when he was right about that. And, um, yeah, we, uh, we would practice, we would write songs, we would record, and we would play out maybe once a month to pay, mainly pay for the, our rent. Yeah, for, for the practice re- space. For, for the practice yeah. space. We would open for people. We'd open for Meatloaf oh, cool. at the Agora. We opened for uh, New, Lords of New Church, Jimmy's former bandmate, Steve Bader's. So are you are you meet, so now you're meeting yeah. now you're at the point in time where now you're starting to meet these yes. uh, these artists and stuff like yeah. Meatloaf and stuff like that right. and is this is this kind of inspiring you even more at this point are you like thinking now all right now I I now I I think I can get to the next level well we were thinking. doing that with Paul Pope also but you're we, already we, there we we did we did two nights in Buffalo at the Klein Hands Music Hall we opened for Triumph oh. and Triumph this was their first. Big breakout album, uh, the Just a Game album uh, in 1979. That was the moment for me I, that at first, like, this is it. This is, you know, I never thought I would reach that. Yeah, right. Because it was in a town that already loved Paul Pope. So we weren't just that opening act that nobody got. Yeah, right. People were there to see us as well. Yeah, you had, you had and your, it was, your own following. And, and it was two nights in a row. And oh. it was awesome. And that was the first taste of, like, the big time. For me, it's like, whoa, this is this is this is what it's like. And I remember looking at the right stage, right, and there's Ricky Emmett kind of standing oh in the wings watching us. And uh, wow, it was it that was that was a big exciting. So so like then yeah, let me just ask you this then. So do you have a gig or anything specific that in your head stands out where you're like, you know, no matter what, that was still the that was the one thing. That's what that was one of them. that for was sure? definitely one. For, I mean, to me, that put that idea of. Well, I can take this step further. Yeah, right. Well, and plus, you know, like something like that, I can I can just see how that would be where you, you got Triumph there. They don't probably know much about you guys as much. No, as, not at all. And all of a sudden, they're there, and they're like, these fucking people are going crazy for these guys. Yeah. They, they have to go see what's going on, you know. They're like, we got I got to see these guys because they can hear what's happening. So for you, that's got to – because, you know, when you're a musician and you're out there, you pick up on all this kind of stuff, you know. You get the, you're getting the energy from there, you're getting the energy there, and then you'll go over and you see Rick Emmett standing there, and you're just like, the surrealness, right. you know, must be – Well, I went from that high – from the very next time we did that in Detroit, it, uh, we opened for uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Oh, my God. Now, we were supposed to do two nights there, but this talk talk about a, 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 a different change. I mean, that audience, first of all, we weren't even listed on the bill. So when the lights went down, they're expecting Richie Blackmore to come out, and here we are, and Paul's wearing mine doing, doing his thing. <laughs> and they were like, they went harsh like, on us, really, boom. Yeah. Th- where do you go to a concert and do you do you bring stuff to throw at the band? <laughs> I mean, it's like oh, I better put this in this pocket so I have <laughs> just sudden, just in case the band sucks. All of a sudden, <laughs> things out of nowhere. They were throwing shit on the stage. Oh my god! And uh, I remember Tom Chris. This is funny because he was the old man, the the man of experience in the band. He was twenty nine. He was older than all of us. He turns around looking at us, and he's getting pelted on the back of the head. He goes, they love us. <laughs> God bless you, Tom. God 
that was a funny. I mean, talk about going from the Triumph experience as a kid, and I'm a kid, I'm 16, to that, to like, oh man, this is scary. Your emotional, your emotions are not in check yet. You're still a kid, man. It, so you're like, oh. and that happened with Tom, and it was, you know, Paul. Paul, it didn't phase him. He was doing his thing. He didn't care. You know, he was he was. He was out to win at least somebody in that audience. And I remember one guy coming up to me after the show goes, I thought you guys were good. You know? <laughs> I guess that makes it. If that's the last thing you remember, that's a good thing, right? We were supposed to do a second night, and we were all dreading it. It's like, oh. But it uh, turned out that Richie Blackmore canceled the show for some reason. Oh, he, they didn't play either. Yeah, he, oh. he called he, he called the show off for some reason. Well, he was a little kiss, kiss, moody dude. <laughs> he only played like six songs. I mean, he his oh. set was real brief. I remember. It Who was, was singing great. then? Who was, was it? Graham was it? Bonnet. Oh. He just joined. He just oh, joined right the band. at that point. As I remember, I'll never forget this. On the Usually the lead singers have the two wedges, two monitor wedges pointed at him. He had a big, like, poster paper. Had the, the the lyrics. I'm a wheel. I'm a wheel. I can roll. I can feel. Yeah. That's how new he was in the band. But he, I got to tell you, he nailed it. He sang his ass off. Oh, really? He was that good, huh? And uh, the, their hit at the time was it. Sit down and go. Yeah. Sit down and go. I mean, he had the way he pulled it off. He had the way he wore his hair. He had the slick back hair, and he had black sunglasses on. So he had the the stance. So you would never know he was looking at a cue card. And nowadays, would it be teleprompter? Yeah, right. Well, nowadays, it's acceptable. People yeah. are doing it, and it's acceptable. But that's how new he was in the group. Yeah, they'd gone a lot more poppy at this point. They weren't the same Dio, Rainbow right. type thing. They had Because Blackmore wanted to go more poppy. He was, yeah. He, yeah, he wanted to be more of a pop oriented thing he would want to get away from the heavy metal thing at that point so yeah that's so that's that's what i'm thinking though like at that point you have a, a more poppy version of rainbow right and the crowd of the dio rainbow crowd showing right. up to this gig and that's why they're pelting you guys with stuff and they saw us come on and with the, it's it we I, I we probably got through two songs is that the only time that's kind of is that is that, was that would you say so the one was your, one of your best gigs was this like one of the ones where you could say yeah it almost other than our our beloved audience in Buffalo it started going the other way I remember one time in Buffalo we played at that Harvey Corky Stage One where there was a punk band from England called the Members in fact they had one MTV hit called I'm in Love with a Working Girl or something like that but at the time they were unknown and. We were the band that brought in the crowd, but the members wanted they it was a, some it was something weird with the club where they wanted to use our sound system and I, it, it was it, it kind of got ugly. But we ended up doing the gig. But there was a few of their punk people in the crowd and they're spitting on us. Oh, you know, God. loogies coming up to the stage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I remember that was a weird time. But you know what? We always counted on our on our crowd to kind of support us too yeah know, right so right was, right you had a, it was a good mix yeah <laughs> enough enough of them yeah you know, yeah there was our crowd then you saw a couple staples in the mohawks <laughs> <laughs> hey man that's that's why it's that's mixing it up you know what though those to me that's a learning that's you i think anybody that's successful in the business uh went through that you go through the booze and you go through the in different audiences, yeah. and, you, and you just take it for stride, and uh, and I think that's that that's the biggest lesson about this music thing is that the first thing you have to learn is not everybody's going to like you, and that's just right. like a lesson you have to learn because I think in the beginning you just assume that everyone's going to eventually like you, and and when it doesn't happen ever because right. there's always going to be somebody who's critical of you. Yeah, uh, that takes learning how to how to deal with some of that stuff and criticism. Exactly. And I think some people don't ever really learn how to deal with it properly. Yeah, it's it's I I look at it as a learning experience. Yeah, but pretty big band in Cleveland was Boku. Absolutely, yeah. Um, heard you know at that point you would hear talked about on MMS a lot, and they were always playing out a lot, and there was a lot of stuff you you heard about them a lot at the time they were popular. Did you start with them, or did, did, did you get involved with them later on after they had already formed? I got involved later on, but I knew them when they were forming. Okay. I knew Frank, and I knew his brother Tommy. We used to hang. Uh, Dennis, briefly, me and Dennis played in a a, a, a a very short, I would say, in a cover band from Youngstown that was called Laser. But, again, that was a band I was only in for like eight months or so, and Dennis kind of came in towards the tail end that I was leaving. 
So we we actually did do a few gigs together. So I I knew Dennis back then. Um, the opportunity came up. Their their album just came out. The first album just came out, and um, it was through my brother Patrick. That's a that's a Beachwood cop, or he was a Beachwood cop. He was a commander of the Beachwood police then. So my brother knows a lot. He knew a lot of people in the community, and he knew Dennis's dad Ellis uh, through the towing business and stuff that. Uh, that Ellis did, and it was through them, it was through my brother that how I found out. Oh, they, they want to, they want you to be their guitar players. Really? And at that time, Gary, Lew I was I, again. It's it always seems to happen when I get involved with somebody. At that time, I was probably three months into my full time job with Gary Lewis. Boom! All of a sudden, Boku comes up, and they're hot at the moment. Their records climbing up the charts. Yeah, I got it. I got to pursue this. Uh, so I didn't really have to quit anything to be involved with Boku because you know the shows were basically spaced out. Um, I was a part of their. I would say their biggest show of their career was when they headlined the Front Row Theater, uh, and um, it's one of those things like once you're in, you're in forever because. There always something comes up with Boku. Uh, I played with them a year ago where we opened for Night Ranger at uh, at uh, Nautica. Oh, uh, so they're still active occasionally, and usually how uh, when they did their thirtieth reunion, I was in Chicago. I wasn't involved in that. Uh, Paul Sedotti played guitar. There's a lot of us guitar players have been in and out of uh, Boku, myself included. Uh, Paul Sedotti played guitar. Danny Powers. Um, uh, uh, Mike McGill, the original guitar player that played on a lot of the first album is, uh, you know, so basically when the Bo when Boku does a show, all of a sudden everybody's involved, oh, you know, yeah. last time, uh, last gig we did, it was uh, myself and Paul Sedoti and, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things. Once you're in, you're in. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's like a, a, a museum of people and then they just bring whoever and we're all and great friends you, you know you, you said you're you mentioned all these guitar players that play with boku yeah is this because the first album has guitar on it that requires a good guitar player in order to, to like you can't just go and hire anybody to play these songs we need somebody it's as good as the guy that originally played them so it just kind of spawns into this thing i think it's a combination of that i mean you had mike mcgill that played on Somewhere Out in the Night. That's his creation, those guitar parts, those great guitar parts. Uh, Sweet Rachel, they actually had session player Tim Pierce. Now, Tim Pierce played on all the Rick Springfield records back in the in the 80s, except for Jesse's Girl. That was that was Neil Gerardo that played oh, on that. There you go. But Tim Pierce is a pretty heavyweight session guy to this day, and that's him playing guitar on, on, on Rachel. All that great solo stuff. So... That was fun to try to emulate that because that's such a great guitar part, and they're great songs. They're they're well crafted songs that stand the test of time. I still think that they they have hit record potential. I think and still in twenty twenty two, the ones the the songs that yeah were out the songs that, that were made then, I think they still sound great. Born and Raised on Rock and Roll still sounds great on the radio. Well, whenever you hear it, yeah. Um, I did play on their second record, although it didn't have the hits of like the first album. Yeah, but I did. I did record with them on the on the second album. And and, and that's another thing I was going to ask. Through all this period, that's all this going on. Were you ever uh, hired as a studio musician to just go in and do session work? Oh, also yeah. through all this, Is sure, this, absolutely. So you're being hired through all this process, also by other people, just to come in and lay down tracks for this or that or the other thing, also. That was starting as early as. 1980 than the Kirk Yano days. Kirk is really responsible for me getting into that world because that led into the association with George Sipple. George uh, George Sipple handled all the jingle aspects, the IX. That's I'm known for that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that.
all that spawned from those days. And throughout the, all that time, I was getting hired to play on, uh, you know, people's records, jingles. Yeah, because when I, when I was looking at your bio, I, I, I wouldn't even I would take the whole interview to yeah. read it off. But th- th- there's one section on there where you list all the artists that you've worked with. Yes. I, I mean, I don't even know how you remember all this. But you, there's it. I actually read it to my girlfriend last night. I did. I, I, yeah. was like, I, I was like, I just want you to hear a couple of the people that he's worked with. And I started reading them. And finally, she's just looking at me like, are you going to shut up? And it's like, oh, I'm halfway done. <laughs> and and I'm like I'm just going and I'm like so was that a, a lot of it was picked up by basically that was from uh, a lot of those artists were from the Gary Lewis days because the Playboy band oh this is now this is how we got to know Peter the Playboy band uh, there would be these sixty shows where there'd be multiple artists instead of having all the artists having their own bands and it'd be set changes in between to make the show run seamlessly would it seemed. It, more sense to have one band back up everybody. So that's what we did. And uh, that's how we backed up Mitch Ryder, Joey Mullen from Badfinger, uh, Peter Noon, oh. uh, Leslie Gore, uh, Otis Day from the Animal yeah, House. Yeah, I saw we, Otis we, Day we, was we, on there, we, too. We, we did a whole tour, a package tour, where he was on it. <laughs> Talk about being a trip, because I, being a tour bus, and there's there's Otis. I mean, he looks just, he, just like the character in... Blues brother, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the character in the movie, you know, <laughs> wild. It's just, it's yeah. It's a, a lot of that. Uh, the, that was through the Gary Lewis years. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. So that was pretty. That was pretty cool. Now this Gary Lewis came right at this time where Boku to kind of like you said, this all kind of happened at the same time. So this is still the eighties. Yes, mid eighties. Uh, this would have been nineteen eighty six. Okay, mid eighties basically. So just just well, eighty six with Gary Lewis, but I I got into Boku in eighty seven. Okay. Because it was weird because I I did a little European run with Gary Lewis in the very beginning. At that same time, my record was taken off. So I had to leave. You know, it's like I said, my career is like the feather in the uh, in, uh, in, in well, Gump. Isn't it funny, too, because, like, back then, and we talk about this with some of the older guys that, that you know, been around doing this for a while. Back in the 70s and even in the 80s, it's not like it really is today where you can be in five bands or six bands. Back then, you were kind of committed. You know, you were you would get into a band, and the other guys in the band expected you to commit to their band, and you were basically like a club. And and you know, for you to do even two bands, yeah, it, you I know, mean, it, it never there was very hardly any conflict, or I didn't like leave anybody abruptly. It was always on a professional manner. Yeah. You know, some of the situations, it was one of those things where the one project would be more working and more for paying your bills. The other one would be on the side to be writing songs and trying to hope for the big break. Yeah, right, right, you right. You know, that sort of thing. So everything you had to do, you know, I mean, the ultimate goal I would be, the coolest thing would be to hit it big with the band you started in your garage. I yeah. mean, that's, that's always the first thing, you know, like the Beatles, that's how they did it. Yeah, you right. know, and, Or the Rolling Stones, you know, or, but that, Obviously, that didn't happen for me. I, I was just so driven to not only to stay employed, but to try to still make this a career, maintain a career so that it, it took me in different directions and different projects. Yeah, at times you did what you had to do, and exactly. at times you did what you wanted to do, but, exactly. but it was a mix of all that. Yes. <clears throat> so what, you know, I'm curious about that. Your, your career is, is, you know, let's just be honest. Very few people can make a career out of playing music, Yeah, especially right now. You know, right. and, and not to change the subject real quick, but you benefit, I think, a great deal from the fact that you've been one of those guys that's learned how to play the drums, guitar, bass. You can sing. You can do that because in today's world, the less people that you have playing with you, you can actually make a living well, doing Well, you know, this stuff. like I said earlier, the more you bring to the table, the better off you are. In this instance, just as recent as, as two months ago, we our drummer, Dave Ferrara, in the, in the Hermits, he, he got ill developed kidney stones and he was we were we were already in Seattle. Dave lives on the west coast. He lives in LA so he didn't have to fly out the day before. He was going to come in the day of. Yeah. I get a call early in the morning from him saying I, I can't do the show. Uh can you do it? I said, "Well, I know the show. I just haven't played drums in a while." I I did okay. I mean, I just let my instincts, I just follow the lead singer. Don't 
you know, I know, it helped that I, I know the show inside and out, so yeah. I know what to do, but just to think of it as a drummer. Uh, the hardest part for me was Henry VIII. He said, it was hard to keep yeah. that, you know, I, I, I'm just not up for that. Yeah. You know, There's a lot, I, a lot of stamina, too, probably, to, it requires also. I, I figured, I, I, I tried to do the easy way out instead of doing the eighth notes on the hi-hat. I just, uh, midway through, I'd like it. Open up the hi hat a little bit, just kind of do it, do it uh, that yeah. way. Right, right, right. But I, I, main thing was I tried to keep the groove and the tempo to follow the lead singer, you know, which being Peter, and I think that's the drummer's role in a in a in a gig like that. You just watch him, watch how he's gonna kick his his right foot, you know. Just follow his meter. He's setting the tempo. Yeah. So it could be, you know, the, he's all about the audience. So uh, the tempos could be either way. But uh, long story short, I had to step up, and in order for we were already there, so we couldn't bring another drummer like uh, a fill-in drummer. You'd have time, so I had to find a pair of drum, some drumsticks, and a drum key, and uh, I ended up doing the show. I did, a, I did, a, I did a couple of them uh, this year. Uh, so again, it pays, it pays to kind of bring as many hats to the table. What do you think about the looper thing? I mean, you kind of you you have a you have a array of pedals in front of you, and when you play, you do the the harmonizing with your voice and stuff like that. But but you know the looper thing's becoming. I know you know Craig Martini. Yeah, Craig's got a pretty cool setup right now, or he's doing the whole looper thing, and and Tyrone does it, um, Hornbuckle. So so, what do you think about getting into something like that? I think the looping is great. It's an art form, uh, which. I for some reason it, it, for me and I'm a drummer I should have this down I've I've dabbled in the looping thing there's times I get I'm so concentrated on trying to work the room where I'd probably hit the loop at the wrong it'll be yeah. at the wrong tempo Yeah right I got you. So my thing is the harmony pedal that kind of it, it you know I'm able to do an eagle song by myself if I can Yeah you know, I mean when it's it comes amazing. to the chorus uh I mean it does I I heard a guy so I don't I don't know his his name, but I heard a guy up at Putin Bay once about twelve years ago or thirteen years ago. Uh, he's solo acoustic guy. All of a sudden, where's these harmonies coming from? And uh, I'm looking. He's there's no track. And uh, I talked to him at the break, and he showed me those pedals. I went up and bought two of them the next once I got oh, yeah. on the mainland the next yeah. day. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, they really they do they they fill it out. It may, it literally sounds like there's another person in there. Right. Yeah. I, I, to me, it's it's about being as musical as possible, you know. Because let's face it, they don't pay bands like they used to in the no. clubs, so everybody's scaled down. That's my point, though. I mean, like a guy like Craig. When we were talking to Craig, he, and, and same thing with Tyrone, those guys. Uh, you know, Tyrone. That's what he does now. He 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 does the looper thing. Yeah, he he's goes great out, at it. He does it every day. I mean, he yeah. does it sometimes two times a day, like like you guys do similar stuff. Play a lot of gigs, but. But but because he's doing the looper thing and it's just him getting paid, you don't. It, 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 I don't see anything wrong with it. Oh. To me, it's about as it's being it's it's being as as musical as you can be, and yeah. it's him creating it. Well, you you it's watch him. those guys, you, you're not you're not bored by it. They're, I get I get envious actually because uh, I watch those guys that are really good with the loopers. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a bit envious. I'm thinking oh, maybe I should uh, put a little bit more time into that. Well, man, I I can't see that you wouldn't do it. I watch it. You can split your brain like the best of them. I can watch. I watch it. It seems like you're effortlessly playing the guitar. You're singing. You're looking in the camera. You're talking to people. You'd be looking at the comments. I'm like, he's doing five things right now. Well, there was. Uh, <laughs> it, it depends on the looper. I mean, if you have a really nice one where it's spaced nice and you can. Add your yeah. You, know, you obviously need a song with repetition. I when I did do the looper, I would do it for like the Rolling Stone song "Miss You." I go that drum beat just and I had the boom dip boom dip you know the bass and and I would just do that would be the repetitious part of those two chords. Yeah, and I did that alone, Lord, I miss you. And I would have to kick it off on the. Oh, everybody wait so long. So won't you come on, come on. <laughs> you know, and I'd kick the looper back on. But there was times where I'd get too excited and all of a sudden it'd be in the wrong tempo. And So my hat's off to the guys that really yeah, have concentrate. the looper. It takes concentration and there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. Like thing. Ed I, Sheeran. I, Ed Sheeran's. Uh, he's well, he's a, the master. He's a master at doing it. Phil Keggy. Yeah. Phil really? Keggy, Phil Keggy does the looping thing when he's doing... Right now, he does a looper when thing. He, when he plays by himself, he he's, does all these beautiful things with. Does the Glass Harp still play out? Do you do, do they ever get together? They, I think they did not long ago. They didn't did. They? Uh, 
unfortunately, John Safara, the drummer, which I played with, and he was he was one of the drummers in Paul Pope Band. Uh, he developed a kidney disease, oh. and uh, he's on the list of being uh, for a, for a transplant. Good. So, uh, God bless you, John. We're praying for you. Uh, I don't think he's done anything since since that's been happening with him. But they have done reunion shows and stuff. I saw. It was before I moved to Chicago. I saw one in, uh, I think, 2007 or eight. They played at JB's in Kent. Me and my wife went. Cool. And stuff. Yeah, Phil Kagi's something else. He's, it, he's, he's just on, a, on another, another plane. Yeah. You know, it's amazing what's come out of this city. Yeah. So you included. I mean, you're in, the, you're in that same group, but you had Glenn Schwartz for a while there. Wow. And you got, I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing what people, you know, the, I, I think we always knew this, but I think from doing this podcast also, you just, you just start to realize how much talent was here, right. is here. Right. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing amount. I mean, it's crazy. Well, this was always my home. Yeah. I lived in Chicago for eight years. With Let's my talk wife. about that. Let me talk about that sure. a little bit. So, so Chicago, you go to Chicago 2010? Yes. About? Yeah. All right, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, the company my wife works for, it was one of those things that was a mandatory move. And it was quick. I mean, I was already, I mean, this came about, where it was discussed, and all of a sudden the decision was made, and it was it was a matter of like a just maybe two and a half months, three months. So we had to, dis, I had to dismantle my studio. I sold some of the gear off because I knew that we were going to be moving into a condo, and it wasn't meant to be a permanent move. We were going to go there as long as it took for her job. It could have been a year. It could have been ten years. It look it was looking to be more like ten years. I think she finally. Wore them, wore her bosses down to let us move back. Oh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I I wasn't a stranger to Chicago. I played it, I I played it regularly uh, throughout the years, especially with Moonlight Drive. We were playing the club scene up there almost more than we were in Cleveland and stuff. So that's how I really got to know the city, and so I wasn't quite a stranger, but to the music community, I was. Yeah, you know, they it's a bigger city. Uh, throughout the suburbs surrounding the city, that's where I kind of felt the, like, well, who's this guy, this hermit guy from Cleveland coming into our, I did kind of get a little bit of that. Yeah. But there were some, there were some people that welcomed me open arms. Jimmy Sons, the late, great Jimmy Sons, he just passed. The singer from Shadows of Night, uh, Gloria. Uh, I knew him, so I played with him a few times. Phil Barron, Phil Barron, Ironically, I'm, I'm flying up there Monday. I'm playing with him uh, uh, Monday night. Uh, he used to have a band. He lived in Cleveland, and he had a great band called Phil Barron and the Bobcats. They used to play all around. And uh, when I moved to Chicago, I knew he was living there. I didn't realize that Phil was originally from Chicago that moved to Cleveland as a child. Oh. Uh, I didn't know that. I just thought he was from Cleveland, you know. So, But, yeah, long story short, yeah, there were some people there that, uh, that did – you know, welcome me with open arms and I uh, had me on their gigs and stuff like that. So how did how did you like overall? How did you, did you rate the whole Chicago thing? Did you did you did you miss Cleveland while you were in Chicago? Oh, I was still coming back. Oh, you were going back. Yeah, it's funny because if you see that PBS special with with us with Peter that they still show, I remember that day because we filmed that in Pittsburgh during the early afternoon, late morning, early afternoon, and I had to drive back to Cleveland to. Spend the last night of my house in Strongsville because well, we already made the move. Most of the things, the move there, so I had to stay the last night in the house in Strongsville and give the keys to my tenants that were renting the house. Oh, and take the last of the things with me. So I, I literally did the final move to Chicago the day we taped that PBS. Special wow, back in 2010. Wow, so you had a little something else on your mind while you were playing yeah. up there. But it was weird, you know. It's it was kind of it was almost like I was starting over for, uh, at, at, at a sense there. But you know, it helped having the job with Peter because it kept me more busy. If it, if it was just if it was if I didn't have that job, I probably wouldn't have made the move. We probably would have been talking a long distance. Sorry, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, I don't know how that would have turned out yeah, because right. obviously I was working here, but it, it worked out. Uh, I ended up getting a little bit of an audience there. I just came back from it. I played there all last week, and uh, and I had good turnouts. And these are solo things you're doing when you're gone? Yeah, I played uh, 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 a dear friend of mine. Her name is Kathy Fleetwood. She's 
She plays the cajon. That's it. Oh, wooden yeah. box. Um, uh, she's great at it, by the way. And uh, I, I play with her on a couple dates. I played with another fellow named Jim Alberico. And uh, I was going to play with Phil, but I couldn't do the Monday night because I was coming home from uh, from a her- the last Hermit show. So we rescheduled it. I'm going to fly in this coming Monday. Cool, cool. So you know, I know I notice when you do a lot of your solo stuff when you're out doing it. You you'll sometimes you're by yourself. Sometimes a lot of times it's you and Rich. Um, and then there's just uh, you know there'll be a drummer added to this one, and there'll be a, sure. How do you how do you go about doing that? Is this just like a whim type thing? I think it depends on the situation, what the club wants. Oh, I you see. You know, sometimes what they want they want a little more than just one guy. I got you. Uh, sometimes they're only going to get the one guy because they want the more uh, they want more the band thing. They don't want to pay for it. I understand. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I mean a lot of it works out. It's 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 due to that. Um, I have a. A great situation out there in the Catawba at the place called The Orchard where I do play solo majority of the time. But lately, we've been playing. I've been taking Rich out there. They love Rich, by the way, out there. And also the drummer from the Raspberries, Jim Bonifani, him yeah. and his wife, Barb, they're regular patrons out there, so they know him. So we decided, let's let's the three of us play, and, we, oh, yeah. and, it's, and, and, it's, and it's wonderful. Jim brings his electronic kit. I'm still acoustic guitar. Rich is on the piano. And we do all the the Beatles stuff, and we do some of the Raspberry songs with Jim. We feature him. This is Jim's other hit record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, know? one after the other with that. Jim that. now is in a great band called Abbey Rodeo. He plays around town. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's how it, that usually happens. Um, uh, sometimes it's like, you know, it'd be fun to have another person on board. And, you, and it's got to be kind of neat that, uh, especially you and Rich together, you could probably, like, pick whoever you guys want at this point and just be like, let's call so-and-so. He'd be perfect for this. or like, And, and I, I can't imagine, unless they're doing something else, you get many no's, right? I mean, well, like- you know what? With me and Rich, we, we, we were so closely tied together that we almost know what we're thinking. You know, yeah, he said you guys have un- incredible synergy together. There, it is. It's weird. I can make a mistake, and he'll make a mistake at the same time. You know, <laughs> it's it's, it's, it it's weird how that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, or uh, the majority of times, a lot of great things. Music. Yeah, it's a lot of great musical moments that, that I have with Rich, and we're lucky to have that. You know, and I think we both we both realized that, but even by the times that we weren't playing especially when i was playing or living in chicago you did it you did a thing with the raspberries at one point yeah yeah with eric carmen and and tell me a little bit about how that went down and, and how was that for you how, how'd that go well it was the original the original lineup of the band eric carmen wally bryson jim bonfanny and dave smalley that was the lineup of the first three albums and how that came about i eric and his and his then wife susan uh they used to come see me and Rich and Debbie Lewin and Jennifer Lee, this little group, side group that we had called the Cover Girls. It was basically the four of us, but the obviously it, the the group revolved around Debbie and Jennifer. We did Mamas and Papas, and we did uh, fun, girly songs and yeah. stuff. But Eric, it, it, vocally, it was a great band, four-part harmonies. So Eric is a fan of that. You know, him being a fan of uh, the Beach Boys and the Beatles and stuff, anything that had vocal harmony... So Eric was there. He used to come see us all the time, and we would play either Rick's Cafe in uh, in uh, Chagrin Falls, or uh, there was another place in uh, that we used to play. I can't think of the name of it now, but uh, but Eric used to come see us, and that spawned in two thousand to where Eric was to, was going to appear at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was an evening with Eric Carmen, and half the show was interview with him. And the second half was a live performance. So the band consisted with Eric, myself, Jennifer Lee, Paul Sedoti, which the three of us went on to be the overdubs that, that was the backing musicians for the reunion. Uh, Tommy Rich was uh, one of the drummers. Uh, Jim uh, Simonium was, was one, of the, uh, one of the other drummers. And, uh, and Paul Sedoti on bass. And... Uh, it was through that association of how we became involved in the raspberry thing. I remember Paul sending me a text saying, Hey, you're going to get called from Eric. Uh, uh, they're, 
the raspberries are going to, he says, don't tell anybody, it's a secret. <laughs> uh, but the original raspberries that were asked to perform at the grand opening of the brand, brand spanking new House of Blues in Cleveland. So this would have been September of that year when I first heard about it. And, uh, and you know, Paul said, uh, he said, yeah, Eric wants us, the three of us, to kind of s- lend support to the band, you know, sing harmonies, add whatever extra acoustic guitar. You know, you see that a lot. With You see the Eagles nowadays. They got a, an Mac array of people. Fleetwood yeah. Mac does. I mean, I, the whole idea is to truly recreate the record in the best possible way. Yeah, there's a lot of layers to these guitars. And exactly. You can do it if you have many guitars. And Eric is all about that. He's all about, you know, you know he says, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's, let's try to, you know, because Eric... He wouldn't want to do anything unless it's perfection. Be it's the House of Blues, and he knew about the House of Blues through his time with Ringo Starr, the Ringo tours. They did a couple of those House of Blues venues. Every House of Blues venue has great sound and lights, and that's that was always important to Eric. So that brought him on board. It was the task of getting everybody else on board, the rest of the original band. Wally was convinced he was in. Jim was in. Eric was in. The hard sell was Dave Smalley. They had to really do do some convincing to get him on board, which which they eventually did. But then Eric had the task of getting those guys on board of having side musicians. And they were all for it. I think Wally was a little hesitant knowing that I was a guitar player, Paul's a guitar player, but Paul played keys. Also, and also Jennifer played key. So it covered all the orchestration, any kind of background vocals. We kind of, we kind of put a, 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 like a foundation behind them, yeah. you know, because there's times where Wally's going to sing and he's going to be off the mic, like, uh, you know, so we were there. We had any time that there, there was harmonies on the records and they were double tracked on the records. That's why they called us the overdubs. Oh. Uh, I remember going to right after... We all signed up and being on board. I went to Buddy Maver's musicians party, which he used to have every year. And that, that party you would see Wally or you'd see uh, Butch Armstrong. You'd see Rich Spina there. I was at the party and I saw Wally and his wife Kay and they were a little hesitant to talk to me. And I'm like, uh-oh, I don't think he's happy about me being on board. You know, being a guitar player. So... When it came time to get to the very first rehearsal, I, like today, I was early. I got there too early, yeah. and there's Wally was there. <laughs> so it was only me and him. And I had to, I, I told him, I said, Wally, I said, look, you are you are the lead guitar player in the Raspberries. I'm, I'm just offering support. I'm never going to get in your way. I'm never going to, you know, I'm not going to be like a hot shot there, you know. Right. I, I'm just contributing to the music. And, uh. I think from that point on, me and Wally were we were we were good. From that point on, I just I had to reassure him. Yeah, right. That I've I'm You're not, not here I'm, for any. I'm other... not going to get in your way. I'm just think of me as of of, of of me playing that overdub part on the record that you're not going to do. I'm, that's what that's that's just think of me as that. And we were good. That 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 was a good thing that that happened because otherwise I I think it would have been kind of tension and and stuff. But we were good from that point on. And, and and even to this day, me and Wally are we're we're great. You know, that you, I'm thinking, you you and Rich both. Your history of as being musicians, a lot of time was spent backing yes other artists up. And although both of you guys have phenomenal singing voices, and you both are phenomenal musicians in general, you find yourself in that in that position. Why do you think that is? Like, what, well, what do you, know you think why? separates the, everything? I can tell you. I can tell you exactly why. Uh, back in '86 or '87, when both of our records were starting to take off, and then it nothing happened, and our careers went stalled as far as recording artists ourselves. We, I, I know me personally. I th- I'm, I'm pretty sure Rich thought the same thing. You know, why don't we just do what we do best? We're great side guys. You know, we love this music. We were fans of Gary Lewis's music. We'll be great side guys. And we get to back up these cool people that we grew up listening to. I yeah. to me, work the thought of working with anybody from the British invasion, 
that was even associated with the Beatles, that was such a, again, that was, I, I would never thought that would ever happen. Yeah. Until we met Billy J. Kramer. I said, oh my God, Billy. I mean, the Beatles wrote his hits and he was, he was managed by Brian Epstein and, and uh, it, to me it was such a thrill. Yeah. Because I was a fan. I was a really big fan of the British Invasion. I remember the first time playing with Peter back in those days when we were we backed him up. It, it, it was such a moment. I remember the very first time playing with him on stage. It was in front of 40,000 people up in Brockville, Ontario. And uh, at the end, they were doing the kind of hush. La, 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 la. Just seeing those 40,000 people. And he had that audience in the palm of his hand. That's the greatness of Peter Noon. Yeah, right. Again, a person from the British invasion that was a part of that whole world that I would never thought I would ever be involved in. Joey Mullen from Badfinger, that was a big one for me. Do you too. notice from dealing with all these people a difference from them from the normal person where it makes them who they are? Like, is there something that stands out amongst the like a Peter Noon where, where you're like... Yeah, he's just different. I mean, like that's why he can do what he do he does, and that's why he is who he is. There's something different about these guys. Well, I think to me the whole the whole thing of them being British, and I've idolized those people. They have a whole different language, you know, yeah. you know, sayings and slangs and stuff. Oh yeah. And that started with Billy J. Kramer. We were learning all that stuff. Lurgy, you know. <laughs> What's, what, what is that? <laughs> you know. Little phrases and phrases little. Phrases and yeah. stuff. And I hear it every by every one of those guys, from Billy to Terry Sylvester from the Hollies, Joey Mullen from Badfinger, and Peter. And all those guys have great hair. I don't understand it. <laughs> it's like, what is it with you? Is it in the water over there? That You know. They but do. Yeah, it was just there's something about. It, 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 it there's a the accent alone, and growing up and listening to those Beatle movies and, uh, and oh, stuff yeah. and uh, yeah, it, it's just such a such a cool thing. Hey, were you a, a John or a Paul guy or, or both? I mean, how, how did, did you lean one way or the other? Probably or? Paul for me. Uh -huh. I mean, I, if I tried to emulate any kind of singer, it would probably would have been him. Yeah, you do sound. You could. You can. You can do the Paul stuff really, really. I well. kinda. It depends on the day. Uh, I, I think you're a little harder on yourself than I. At least my ears hear it that way. Um. So, we, we real quick, the old Coliseum. Yes. You ever played there? I played there once, one time. Mid Park High School Jazz Band. Really, high school. Nineteen seventy eight. We played. It was like it was the beginning of the or, uh, or yeah, it was like the end of that 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 year, and we played at a Cavs game. Oh, really? The, our jazz band played at a at a, at a Cavs game. So it was like a halftime thing, or yeah, was it, really? Yeah. And I treated it as a rock star moment because I I had my Marshall half stack, and I had my uh, Flying V uh, <laughs> that I sold to my friend Craig years ago. Uh, but and you're uh, like what, sixteen, seventeen years old? I was here? fifteen. Wow. I just, no, I just turned sixteen. I just turned sixteen, and I thought. This is probably I just saw Rush play there like a week ago, you know, and, and I saw Paul McCartney and Wings there at, at this yeah. place. And, and now I'm here playing, you are. I'm playing the same room. And although, there's people there because there's a Cavs game going on, so you're playing to a house. We used to do this piece of music called the Gaza Strip. Hit horns and everything. Hit horns. It was an F major. Uh, any of the musicians out there? So there was a long stretches of empty bars and the, and the music director goes go he would point at me and i just, ah, I just, just, just go. so you were soloing out i was solo out at like 16 bars oh my god and then he'd bring up and did that, you play that right now like do you remember like, i remember it i could play it that's awesome <laughs> i remember that was like that was my big moment at the coliseum no I, I don't remember if anybody paid attention. No. They're probably going to the bathroom getting a, Yeah, and this is the time there's no cell phones, no one's recording. All the anything. lights are on. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like a big stage no, we were like in the, yeah. on the corner of the court. Yeah, but this is a, but this would be the first big moment yeah. in your life. That would have been. Yeah, would the first been. big moment in your whole life. Yes. And the Coliseum was just the coolest place. Absolutely. So, you know, if you're if, if anybody that remembers that place, the the, the stories just about the Coliseum could right. go on forever. Um but I do want to talk about what's going on now. Yeah, uh, we talked pretty much. We covered most of your most of your past and your history. I'm, I'm, like I said, we could talk for a day, but um, so basically, right now you're doing the solo thing, 
And like I said, occasionally you'll bring in other other people to come play with you. Like you said, depending on the venues, a lot sure. of times, you and Rich are a thing. You yeah, know, we, Rich and you. Uh, when we had Rich in here, he, he said the same thing. He's yeah. like, I don't know what it is about me and Billy, but right. it just works perfect, and that's the end of that. You know, you guys get along well, yeah, absolutely. You, and you guys, we're like he's 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 the brother from a different mother. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, you know, I've 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 known his parents and stuff, and uh, I used to you know you know Rich would have the studio in his house in his parents' house and. I remember uh, we were doing Sonny Geraci's album in the late 90s yeah. there. And his dad would be cooking something. And you walk in the house, it has this aroma of, oh, he's cooking Italian yeah. today. He used to make this fast pasta sauce. So I used to go up in the kitchen and like, what, hey, Gigi, what you cooking today? You know, oh, Bill, here. You you know, so you'd always show me the tips. and Awesome. But, yeah, so that's that's how close I am with Rich. Yeah, and then and you're doing Herman's Hermits. Yes. And that's that's basically what you do now. I mean that's 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 the that's where it's all happening now. You're making money. I would say that Herman's Hermits is definitely the full time day gig for both myself and Rich. Yeah. Peter keeps us busy. Um we were really busy up until the pandemic. We would have had a re probably one of the busiest years twenty in twenty twenty. Yeah. But obviously the whole world shut down. And we're just now starting to get back to it. Even though it's it's a couple years after, it's you know some of the venues are kind of slow about getting back into full concert mode. Even though we're back and a lot of tours are happening, uh, and most of our stuff is back, but not all of it. But it's coming. It's yeah, coming yeah. Back. And and the crowds are coming back. And and yeah. I mean the only the only thing that's got to be kind of a thorn in, in at least Peter's side is the fact that how much it costs to fly for one, uh, the costs of everything yeah, since the pandemic right, sure. have skyrocketed now. Yeah, so, that, that's definitely it has made a difference in things where he's using more, you know, uh, whatever discounts he can get. Yeah, you got to make it happen. It's yeah, a business, right? You, know, you got to cut your costs whenever you can. How do you feel about flying? Are you are you do you are you, is it, are you indifferent or are you just kind of like just this part of the day? It's part, part of part of the gig. Yeah, you know? yeah. How how, do, how does the Herman Hermits thing actually start? How do you how do you how do you get on board with the whole whole Herman's Hermits Herman's Hermits God? The hardest thing to say for me. I don't know what it is, but how do, how does it start? How do you get involved? How does it? I mean, like, is it is this something that you think this is you'll ride this out until? Sure. I, well, with um, we used to back Peter up back in the late eighties. It was that, that show I talked about in Canada we did with him, and and throughout the nineties we backed him up uh, and stuff. So we got to know him, and uh, Rich got on board with him sooner than I did as, as a full-time member. And I, I joined in 20 or 2009, you know, at the, the raspberries things ended, uh, it, that was never meant to be a lot. That was only meant to be one show, but it turned out to be a whole tour. And at that same time, I kind of went back with Gary Lewis as a drummer towards the, my last, I would say my last four years of my tenure with Gary. I, I went back with him after we initially left. And uh, and I was getting calls from Rich. Rich is saying, you know, Peterson call you. He wants the two. He wants the two guitar thing, like like the original band. And uh, this was going on for a couple months, and then finally Peter did call, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. I just need to work out a notice with Gary. I mean, we we weren't Gary. We weren't playing that much. I mean, probably forty shows a year, maybe at that point. But still, I still had to be available because I, you know. So I had to work out a, a, a you know, a notice with with Gary, and uh, I was uh, I went from being a playboy to a hermit uh, within a month. <laughs> there it is, <laughs> and I, I, I've been with him ever since. So what's it like? I mean, like, like how 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 would you uh, describe this versus the other stuff? I mean, you're you're older, you're wiser, you're a different person now. For one, and you're you're you're. It's a different time. I mean, that's really what. Well, I, you know, it's it, the traveling gets harder. You know, I I don't. I don't drink anymore. I'm a sober person. You figured that would make it easier. It it does a little bit. Uh, do you ever have like, like? <laughs> so you have like this. It's a situation where when when they were big, you know, that was the time where you'd have oh yeah, eighty women screaming right, right. in the crowd and all this stuff. Right now, right? It, it was a, like I said, it was a lot different time. And these are the same. The people who are coming out to see you now are the same ones that came out and saw the oh, yeah. tournaments back sure. in the day. You know. Like, what's the crowd like? I mean, like, do they ever? I mean, they're, obviously they're not screaming and stuff like that, but I mean, like, what, what, what is you it? You know, it's it kind of borderlines a lot of times. You know, his fans, 
his fan base they're the noon they call the, the, they're called the Nunatics. Oh, beautiful. and they're sweet. They're sweet that they, you could tell that they were those young girls that had posters of Peter on on their walls. They they still love him, and he engages them. Uh, it's just the, the whole experience. It, it's it's you know Peter is hands on from every aspect to how he presents himself, how he wants us to be presented, uh, how the lighting is, how the is it sound sound and lights are very important to him. Uh, he's a perfectionist in that way, and he's a perfection. He's by far the best entertainer I've ever worked with because he knows how to read an audience better than anyone. No kidding. Anyone. Uh, I mean, it, it, if something were to happen where we couldn't show up for the show via the, the missed flight or something and he made it, he would be able to pull that show off without us. I, 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 I can guarantee it. You how give him you give him a guitar and a microphone and an audience. He'll do it. He'll do it. How much longer do you think he's going to be doing this? Do you have any idea? Is he he's, shown any signs of slowing down? He says ten more years. <laughs> That's what he says. Jesus. God. And I think he's very serious about it. I mean, by the if you go if you see one of his shows online or, or live, uh, there's no inkling of him appearing to be slowing down. But all of us have better days than you know. I I think what the, I could speak for myself more than him. Uh, where, you know, it's, it's a lot of no sleep. I mean, there's times where we have lobby calls at 2 a.m. to get to the next thing uh -huh. and then we're flying and then we have to get to the next town and, and, uh, do the hotel thing into the sound check and we're, uh, there was one weekend where I literally didn't really catch up on sleep until after the whole run was done. Wow. So that gets harder the older you get. I'm, again, I'm speaking for myself. Yeah. Um. Uh, I can only imagine how it would be for Peter, uh, but uh, by looking at him and seeing him, you know, from standing behind him every night, he's born to do this. He's basically. born to do it. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, that's what's that's so cool. Yeah. So, how can people get a hold, uh, watch your, watch your, uh, um, the live stuff that you do, and what, 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 what's the best way to watch all that? Facebook. I know you have a Facebook. I usually thing. do that on Facebook Live. That's the only place where I do it from. Okay. I tried to link it up with YouTube, and I don't think I have a lot of listeners on the YouTube channel. Everybody that follows me, they follow me on Facebook. And late, well, during the pandemic, I was doing those twice a week. Um, I, I, I I started doing the live streaming thing even before the pandemic because I was I was just new back in Cleveland. I was trying to drum up business, so I'd be on a gig, and I just oh, right, I'm gonna go live. And I, uh, uh, the reaction I would see, the people were loving it. Yeah. And uh, during the pandemic, I was I was I was getting close to at least a ninety to hundred people a show because wow. everybody was locked down at yeah. home. Yeah, that's all the time. So I, I built a little studio like you have here, uh, a little broadcast thing in my music room, and yeah. and uh, I just did a broadcast Tuesday, and I still want to engage the online audience. I now if I could do one once a month. I, I try to do at least once a month. If not, uh, it all it's all due around my schedule. Cool. But I still want to I still want to try to keep doing that just to engage the, the online audience. Yeah. So so Facebook Billy Sullivan is your is, just look that up if they yep. want to watch you online. You guys are playing out. You play at the Orchard. You guys play in Middlebrook Heights sometimes. Yeah. We we do. Me and Rich do steady Mondays at the Arnie's Clubhouse in Middlebrook Heights. Yeah. Although I won't be there Monday, Rich is going to be there with Don Kruger. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm flying to Chicago to to be with Phil Barron at the Redhead, the the legendary Redhead Piano Bar downtown Chicago. Yeah, within a week, there's always a, a number of places they can go see you play. Yeah. Somewhere you're playing out every week. I'm easy to find. Yeah, easy to find. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having. We're going to wrap it up right there. We're all out of time, and uh, yeah. So if you guys go look them up on Facebook, you can watch. Like I said, I've seen several several. Live performances, if they're they're really great. He's got good sound. You can watch them. Or go see him live. Much better time going to see him live. Thank you much. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot for coming, man. This Thanks. has been a blast. All right, that's it for us, guys. We'll Level see you guys. up, Cleveland. <laughs> I'm in a band. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys next week.
It is I, ZM Delgado, author of the Rust Belt Rock Review at ZachoLantern.com, and this is your weekend concert calendar update. First off, Friday the 11th at The Foundry, you're going to be able to check out my boys in Beast Killer with support that evening from the A-10s, Kill the Fall, and Papers. Up next, Saturday the 12th at No Class Cleveland, Inducing Panic will be hitting the stage with special guests Iron Bison, The Hams, Lazy Ass Destroyers, and DJ Sam Sinister. So there you have it, Cleveland, your weekend concert calendar. I hope to see you out there at the clubs, and I hope you continue to rock on, Rust Belt. Back to you, Brian. That'll be fine.